I am about to dismiss Children's Church. There's a change this morning I want to announce, and then there's something I need to say. We have some brave workers who said we can let children up to about age 12 come upstairs. Now, let me say this to you children. This is not free playtime you're going to. You're going up there to have a children's level church experience. So Children's Church is now dismissed. Please go with the right attitude and uh, please don't make these workers regret volunteering to do this service today. <laughs> You're dismissed. Those of you who are still here with me, please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. I frequently come to text when I'm preparing sermons that I feel unfit to preach, unworthy. Uh, that happens often, but most especially when I come to this text, I always feel unworthy, but when it's pressed so hard upon your heart, there's nothing to do but stand up and preach it. There's a time, a need for sermons like this. Uh, if you read the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, you will find that they're filled with Pronouncements of judgment upon a nation that is turned away from its God. Grace is sprinkled through there, of course, but it's basically a message of judgment and condemnation. And at the conclusion of that, I believe, I, I fall in the school that believes that things are pretty much in chronological order here. Isaiah has this vision. And I believe God has let him have what's in the first five chapters to prepare his heart for the call that's about to come. And... That's where we are today in our text. I want you to bear with me. I want to talk with you about worship that works. And I want to set the stage by sharing with you an article that was uh, shared with me this week on, on the Internet. It comes from a website called The Richest. It's, uh, the article is called The Ten Most Christian Nations on Earth. I want you to listen just a moment to these staggering statistics. This was done by the Pew Research Council, which kind of blows my mind. You would think someone with that name would know how to ask the right questions to get the right answers. But here's what, the United States of America is number one as the most Christian nation on earth with 243,000, 243,060,000 believers in the United States of America. That is 11.2% of the entire world population, 78% uh, of our nation claims to be Christians. Oh, God, that it were so. I have a slide about this later on down here. There you're looking. Those are the others in order. Brazil, Mexico, Russia, the Philippines, Nigeria, China, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, for Ghana, Germany, and Ethiopia, the 10 most Christian nations on earth. Pew Research Council, what kind of questions were you asking? In America, uh, you have under God in your pledge of allegiance, you have in God we trust on your money, does that make you Christian? Well, surely they took in all the other denominations, just let people walk in and sign up, and no, no repentance, no life-changing conversion. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, are you Democrat or Republican? Well, I'm Christian. I'm sure not a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist. I'm, you know, I'm that other thing. <laughs> I'm a Christian. Well, do you really worship the God whom you say you believe in? That's a vital question. We're going to see about that this morning. We're in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read through the first part of verse 9. I'm going to stop right there for a very specific reason. And I just ask you now to follow as we read from God's holy word. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. 
And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people. Father, There's enough here to fill the rest of the day if we talked in depth about all the vital points in this passage. We don't want to do that. We want you to use us somehow just to quickly, concisely get this message across, get this picture across in all of our hearts and minds. What is the worship that works there where you sit upon your heavenly throne? Help us to understand. And Lord, if there be among us any today who are not qualified to perform this kind of worship, we'd ask you to reach down from heaven, touch those hearts, Show them what they need to do. Convince them of their need for repentance and their need for trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Lead them, Father, into your great family of God. Make us all become true worshipers. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every church on the planet goes through a thing called worship. We have worship services. And somehow because we use that kind of terminology, I think people get it in their mind, well, worship is what you do when you go to the building. When you get in the church house, that's where you worship. And when you leave, you've had a good worship experience, and it'll be fine. You'll come back next week and have some more of that. Is that the worship that works with the holy God? I think not. And I think our text will convince us this morning that I'm correct about this. I hope you see something in here that will... Wake you up. Now listen, the qualifications for worship are given here. And I'm going to share them with you as we go along. First, from the first four verses of the text, we see an awareness of the Lord's holiness. An awareness of the Lord's holiness. In the year that King Uzziah died, that was somewhere around 740, 750 B.C. Scholars kind of differ a little bit, but I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Let me stop right there just for a minute and preach <laughs> until I just can't stand it anymore. The throne is the only place where the Lord can sit and still be Lord. If you have him anywhere else in your life, he's not Lord and you have no right to call him that. He has to be up on the throne. He sits there alone. It's his throne. He shares it with no one. The train of his robe fills the temple. If, he, if in your life the presence of the Lord does not fill your life with glory and excitement and joy. Something's missing. You need to find out what's wrong with me. He doesn't want to have a little corner of your uh, life. He wants to have the whole thing. He wants to inhabit it all and just fill it with himself. That's what it did here in uh, Isaiah's vision. And if you have him anywhere else, please have another coronation service in your life and say, Lord, you... Take the throne. Take the seat. Fill me with your glory and make me everything you want me to be. The Lord. Who is this that Isaiah has seen? Well, we come over to John chapter 12 in the New Testament. We see verses 39 through 41. Now, I didn't put every verse on the, a, a, a slide up here. You need to write these down in your bulletin. There's a sheet inside there for taking notes. John 12, 39 through 41. Here's what... The Bible says, therefore they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I could heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Had I read on in verse 9 down through 10, 11, you'd see that coming from the mouth of the Lord. Who was it that Isaiah saw sitting on that throne? It was not God the Father. It was God the Son in all of his glory. In all of his glory. Again, over in Acts chapter 28, verses 25 and 26, they're attributed to the Holy Ghost. So the, the Holy Spirit's involved in this. So we have the entire Trinity, but the person that, that Isaiah saw was a, a pre-incarnation appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ filling the temple with his glory. You and I need to have had that vision at some point in our life. One of my favorite Bible commentators is a Scottish fellow named Alexander McLaren. He said, our eyes have seen the king in as true a reality and in better fashion than ever Isaiah did amid the sanctities of the temple. If you in your sin have come to a place where you have recognized your 
unholiness and his holiness and his desire to make you like him and you've surrendered your heart to him and he's come into your life and taken away your sins, you have had a better vision of the Lord than Isaiah did. It's almost hard to imagine, but that's what, the, what uh, the, the great man said and I believe it. Verse 2, above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. One cried to another said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled, is full of his glory. Seraphim. From what I read, this is about the only time in the Bible they're used as a positive, angelic kind of a thing. They're used, that term is used several times to uh, describe little uh, creatures that, that God sent into the wor world to judge people. But here, uh, they're, they're serving the Lord. They're there as his servants doing positive things. Seraphim. The term literally means burning ones. Burning ones. Now, there's something we can compare that to. You know, when God gave Moses the pattern for the Ark of the Covenant, he said there's the mercy seat, and over the mercy seat there'll be two cherubim. They'll be made out of gold. Their wings will be stretched over. And here it says these seraphim are, are standing over the Lord on his throne, kind of more or less in the same position. But back there in that Ark of the Covenant, those things were inanimate objects. They couldn't move unless someone put poles in the rings of that altar and picked it up and carried it. Here they're mobile. They've got wings. They can move. And I see in this a, a fantastic uh, symbolism. Cherubim there, inanimate objects, symbols of something that is to come. But as Isaiah gets this vision here in this temple, he sees it being fulfilled. It's no longer an inanimate symbolic thing. He is seeing the Lord at work. He's seeing fiery creatures uh, proclaiming his glory. Uh, John said, there's, there's one coming who's going to baptize you with fire. <laughs> and and, and th th these creatures are there, and they're, and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Uh, and most of the people who write commentaries on this say, okay, one for God the Father, one for God the Son, one for God the Holy Spirit. All three included in that, whatever. You know, we sing the song, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So he's, he's getting a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ here. These seraphim... Uh, Sometimes they, they, they bring judgment and, you know, Jesus, he came to bring grace and salvation, but he's also going to be an instrument of judgment one day. We need to understand that. The seraphim declared the whole earth is full of his glory. Uh, one great Hebrew scholar says it would be much more proper had it been translated literally, the fullness of the whole earth is his glory. <laughs> Everything you see on this earth has to do with the glory of God. And look at verse 4. The post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. Oh my goodness. I don't know any preacher anywhere in the world who wouldn't like to have a, 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 a pillar shaking experience in their church someday when the power of God and his glory would just descend on church and just shake things. The, the, the Hebrew word there literally means the foundation of the doors. That which held the whole thing up. It just shook. Why? The power of what was going on in that place. The presence of the Lord and the worship of the seraphim and their proclamation of his glory, his holiness, shook the entire place. Oh, Lord, come on down and shake us again. We need to be shaken. Not just in this church, but in every church around the planet. We need a shaking experience with the, with the Holy Spirit of God. We ask you to come down. Awareness of God's holiness. Now, I'm going to say something right here before I move on. Isaiah has a really radical reaction to what he sees. Look at what he says here in verse 5. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Oh, don't you wish you could talk to these people sometime and say, hey, what made you react that way? You and I kind of trying to fit ourselves into the picture, and I hope that's an experience you get into. A, when, when you read the Bible, try to fit yourself in. How would I have reacted had I been there to see that? What, was it the, the awesome power? No. But you knew about Yeah, I knew about the power. The power yeah, no, no question of the power. What, was it the glory? Well, not really. But Isaiah, you saw, yeah, I saw the glory, but that's not really what made me react the way I did. Well, Isaiah, what was it? And he would say, very simply, I believe, it was the holiness. It was the holiness that broke me, caused me to confess myself, my sins. 
Oh, the power and the glory, yes, those are awesome things. But when you're thinking about God and his power and his glory, do not forget that God is above all things perfectly holy. Take away the holiness, the power and the glory goes with it, I believe. God, of course, he's all those things. He can't change. You can't take it away. But it was the holiness that got right down into, into Isaiah's heart that caused him to cry out, I am undone. Broken, wasted. It could be other translations of that Hebrew word. I am undone. Because I have seen the King, King Jesus, the Lord of hosts. Jesus would, have, would refer to this in the Gospel of John. Isaiah uh, desired to see, I'm sorry, Abraham saw my day. Isaiah is, is quoted often by Jesus in, in the Gospel of John and other places. So Jesus knew Isaiah and he knew about this experience. He was there. Now, listen to me just a moment. As you go through the Bible, you find other people who have these kinds of encounters. And I want to just read a few passages and let you see something common in every one of them. In Judges chapter 2, uh, chapter 6, verse 22, Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Big capital A. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. <coughs> Judges 12, uh, 13, 21. There's a man named Manoah and his wife. When the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Job 42, 5 and 6, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Luke 5, 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. Revelation 1, 17 and 18, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. What happened to all these people when they encountered this Lord? And we believe that every one of those appearances again was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. What did all of them do? They were broken by that encounter. They cried out, I'm sinful. I'm going to die. I'm, I'm, I, I hate myself. I repent. Oh my goodness. Just a view of the holiness of God. The pure, unmitigated, never changing holiness of God. Of the Lord Jesus Christ is enough to bring great men to their knees in repentance and hate for the sin that has made them so unholy. Now, in the life of Isaiah, this is a pivotal moment. I believe he's already been a prophet, a young man. I believe that what goes on in the first five chapters are messages God gave him, but God's about to turn up the heat. <laughs> God's about to bring a very powerful message to the nation of Judah. The southern half of the kingdom is divided at this time, and Isaiah ministers in the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Judah has followed the, the uh, example of Israel in the north and has turned away from God, turned to idols, and God's about to pronounce judgment on them, and he needs a special man to carry the message. And so he gives him this special anointing. The acknowledgement of one's sinfulness. I want to say to you, you will never ever qualify to be a true worshiper of the Lord Jesus Christ until you acknowledge, I am a sinner. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I abhor myself. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. I, in his presence, I am nothing. He is totally pure. I am totally impure. I hate myself. I hate the life that's made me like this. You need to come to that place in order to be a true worshiper of Jesus Christ. Oh, how I wish the people from the Pew Research Institute had, had those thoughts in mind when they ask, 260-something million Americans think they're Christians? Have you ever abhorred yourself? Have you ever come into his presence and repented in sackcloth and ashes? Do you know who you're talking about here when you say you're a Christian? No knowledge of the holiness of God in the lives of most people. A glorious thing happens right after that. Verses 6 and 7, acceptance of God's forgiveness. I love this. Some of the scholars say there were only two seraphim. I, I don't get that from reading it. We see two doing action. It doesn't mean that there weren't more than that. But then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. 
Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Earlier I said they had six wings, one to cover their face, one to cover their feet, and with, uh, with two they covered their face, two their feet, and with two they flew. And this seraphim probably indicates that Isaiah at this point in time is still outside the temple looking in, seeing all these things happening. And the seraphim comes to him, and he has gone to the altar. The temple has the altar, the place where the uh, sacrifices were made, where animals were burned, symbols of Jesus Christ who's going to hang on a cross one day, the, the perfect Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. He goes there and he picks up a coal. And he used tongs. Now, I, I, I got, see, I love reading the Bible and thinking about the stuff I find here. It just raises questions and I have such a good time dealing with that. Now wait, you are a fiery being. You're on fire. How come you got to have tongs to pick up that coal? Well, there is something in heaven burns a lot hotter than fire. <laughs> and even, even, if I, even me being a burning being, I couldn't pick up that coal without the tongs. And he brought it, he touched Isaiah's lips. Now listen just a minute. If you got the altar where the sacrifices are and a, a, a seraphim goes there, or a seraph <laughs> goes there and he picks up a coal and brings it, what, where would that coal come from? I heard Dr. Paige Patterson say this in a sermon one time in Florida and I almost jumped out of my seat. It sounded so good. What was on that altar was something symbolic of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that would happen some 700 years in the future. It's a sacrifice that's been made for the sins of mankind. And this seraph picks up one of those burning embers left over from the last sacrifice, touches it to the lips of this man. Your sin is forgiven. Your lips are purged. You're, 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 cure, you're pure. You're been, you've been made pure. Oh, listen, just a little touch of Jesus, wherever it comes, will make you pure and holy again. And, and I think that's what happened here in the life of this man. This has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. Uh, if you go back into Leviticus 9, 24, you'll find that the first time fire ever occurred on that altar, it was God himself who lit that thing. And it appears, as we study the Bible, that it never went out. It was kind of like, more or less like what we call today an eternal flame. So something that God had done there through the sacrifices was what the seraph used to purge Isaiah and make him holy. Worship. True worship. The worship that works with God has to flow from pure hearts. It is not something we can do at a moment in time when we decide to spend a few minutes behaving ourselves and worshiping and then get up and walk away unchanged, and go back to living just like we always did in our sin, that is not worship, and God will not accept that. It just won't work. Worship has to flow from pure hearts. Now, I've preached many times here, and you, some of you have heard it. We get saved. We, we get cleansed of all our sins. We don't stay cleansed. We go out and sin again. Yes, we do. We're, we're imperfect human beings. We have no control over some of those things. We make mistakes. All of us do. But what, when a true child of God realizes I have just stepped in mud again. What are you going to do? I want my feet washed. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to run to Jesus and confess that sin and get cleansed again. You need to keep that heart pure. And because you can't keep it pure by not sinning, you have to continually confess those sins and get that foot washing that we talked about in John 13. How many remember the sermon, Jesus and Toe Jam? All right. The rest of you must not have been there. I don't think anybody's ever going to forget that one. Anyway, that's how you stay holy. Constant awareness of sinfulness and a, your need to, to be purged, to be cleansed. And you keep coming back to Jesus, Lord, wash my feet again. Wash them again, wash them again. I stepped in the mud again. Clean me up. It's when we receive that forgiveness, now we're qualified. We, we've, become a, we've become aware of the holiness of God. We've acknowledged our unholiness and now we've accepted his forgiveness Something that's been on the altar has touched us. <laughs> in, in those days, of course, it was the sacrificial animals, those symbolic things, those shadows of something yet to come. In our life today, it's Jesus himself who paid the price, and something about him has touched us, and we are now made holy again in the eyes of God. Now, it would be a great hallelujah sermon right here. Everybody could go home feeling really good about themselves if I didn't have this next point. <laughs> but see, when you surrender yourself when you come to Jesus and you get that forgiveness, something off that altar touches you and makes you clean and makes you whole and makes you pure. 
Something has to flow from that. Once Isaiah is qualified, not before, not until, but once he is qualified, now the seraph stops speaking and another voice in this heavenly vision speaks. Who shall I send and who will go for us? Now I want you to notice something. This is the Lord speaking. This is the person on the throne, not those flying around the throne. This is the one seated upon the throne. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I was, this was pointed out to me. I, I've seen it before, but I never really lodged, locked in on it and studied it. Why, why the singular and then the plural? Um, different people say, okay, it was the Lord and the seraphim. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think the Trinity is included here again. Just back in, uh, you know, back in Genesis 1-1, uh, you have in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, a plural noun for God with a singular verb. The Trinity was there and it's shown all the way through the Bible in many, many ways. I think it's the whole Trinity of God is speaking here. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He did not command anything, did he? He did not say, Isaiah, now I've cleaned you up. Here's what I want you to do, boy. Get up, dude. I got work for you here. I'm, I'm the Lord and you're going to go out here and do this. He didn't do that, did he? He posed an invitation. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Don't ever downplay the importance that your individual will has in the mind and heart of God. He does not, he, see, he is God. He can make every one of us little automatons that just move around like little robots doing nothing but his will all the time. He has that power. He could do that. But he chooses not to. Why? Because he wants us to make choices that will glorify him and that will demonstrate that we worship you, Lord. He wants us to make choices. He doesn't want to direct Isaiah to do something. He wants Isaiah to make a choice to surrender his, his will to God's will. And that's what happens. Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. Now listen just a minute. There is no other acceptable response. If you hear that call of God, you better be ready to say what Isaiah said. Here am I. Send me. Now, he's not going to call everybody the way he called Isaiah. He's not going to call everybody the way he called me and, and the other pastor over here and these men who are ministering here in music. He has specific calls for specific people. But there are some things he has for all people. He has called all of us to be part of the family of God and to be uh, instruments in his uh, hand as he tries to win a lost world to himself. He has called all of us to do something. And the only acceptable response is, here am I, send me. You see, had Isaiah said anything else, I believe God would have looked at him and said, well, you know, hey, just a minute. You can't be in my worship service. Go away. Not obeying me equals not worshiping me. Don't talk to me about worship if you're not going to do the things I tell you to do. If you're not going to let me be Lord. If you're not going to obey me when I give you these invitations, when I give you these commands. And there are commands in the Bible, by the way, for you and me. God leaves it our choice whether or not we're going to obey those commands. It must be here am I send me. You know, the great blessings of being a Christian don't come from going to church, singing the songs, hearing the message, giving the offerings. They don't really come from prayer. There are blessings included in all those things, of course, and we're so glad there are. But the greatest blessings come from doing what the Lord asks you to do and letting him work through you to accomplish something. The greatest joy comes from serving him. And if you don't ever get involved in serving, you'll never touch the greatest joy that God has for you. God, Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. What kind of life are you making today? Are you giving service? Albert Schweitzer, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know, 
The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. One great man of God said, For the Christian, our highest service is to serve God, and we serve him by serving our fellow man. Another said, Our greatest legacy will be those who live eternally in heaven because of our efforts. Billy Graham said, I am convinced the greatest act of love we can ever perform for people is to tell them about God's love for them in Christ. Service. Isaiah, you've seen the holiness of the Lord. You've acknowledged your sinfulness. You've received God's forgiveness. What next? A life of service. A life of service. Go back into Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 after you read about how salvation is a gift of grace, a free gift by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You'll see that we're saved for service that God ordained from the foundation of the world. We've been saved to serve. That is the true, true worship. Oh, I would like to experience the greatest blessings God has for me, but I just can't make a commitment to be doing stuff. I mean, people out there are going to think I'm weird if I start acting too Christian, start talking too much about, well, they, or just all kinds of negative things are going to happen. And I, I really want those blessings, but I don't want to do what I have to do to get them. Uh, some unknown person, wiser, never grow a wishbone where your backbone ought to be. Don't go around wishing for the blessings of God if you're not willing to do what it takes to get the blessings of God. Service is where the greatest blessings in the Christian life come when you obey him and he rewards you somehow down here on this earth. William Wordsworth, the poet, said, The best portion of a good man's life is his little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and love. You may never be called to stand in a pulpit and preach. You may never become the next Billy Graham or whatever. You may never do any of those great things. It may just be little acts of obedience you do as you go through life day by day. If, if God gives it to you to do, you do it, and you'll be blessed. The awareness of God's holiness, acknowledgement of one's sinfulness, acceptance of God's forgiveness, then assent to God's service. We all want to be true worshipers of the true and living God. You know, I tell people, we, we really need to get busy doing this down here. This, what we're in right here now is the dress rehearsal for heaven. Because once we get there, it's going to be just constant worship. <laughs> we ought to get used to it down here so it won't be a new thing when we get up there. Listen to this as I close the message. True, heartfelt worship of our holy God will always result in work done in his name. All work done in the name of the Lord and for his glory, will always be accepted as true worship. Worship is not a temporary experience that happens once or twice a week or month or whatever. Worship, true worship, the kind of worship that God accepts, the kind of worship that works in heaven where it really counts, is a lifestyle that's lived by every believer 24-7, 365 days a year or six, depending. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. And you and I need to continue to come back to a passage like this and look at it and say, now, let me fit myself in here. What if I had been Isaiah? What if I had seen the pure holiness of God? What impact would it have had on me? I would have fallen on my face. I would have said, Lord, I'm unclean. He would have cleaned me up. I would have jumped up and said, Lord, what can I do for you now? That's true worship. And then when you come together in the house of God to join together as the family of God, worshiping in song and prayer and giving and preaching and whatever, God is looking down at you, oh, that is true stuff going on there. That worship I'm seeing here on Sunday morning flows from a life of worship I've been watching all week long, and I can accept that. That's good. I'm happy. Pray with me. Father. I don't know any thinking person who wouldn't like to be closer to you, wouldn't like to receive greater blessings from you. I don't know any thinking person who doesn't know that what you give us is better than anything we can get for ourselves, no matter what we're doing. I ask you, Lord, to help us all today surrender ourselves anew, beginning here at the pulpit. Help us all today to surrender ourselves to a life of true worship, a life 
in which everything about us just cries out worship to the holy living God. And Lord, may it result in service that will bring great things in your kingdom. Thank you for the grace and the mercy you've shown us. Continue to show us. Thank you for Jesus, all we have in him. Lord, may he be glorified in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you're a born-again Christian or not. When we have a congregation this size, you never know if everyone out there is saved. If there happens to be somebody who has not made that decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness. I wish you would just try to put your life over against the holiness of Jesus, the holiness of God and say, look, I just don't measure up. And there's nothing I can do that will ever make me measure up. I can never wash away all the stains and blemishes that sin has put on my life. I need something off that altar to touch me. I need Jesus to touch me and take away my sins. And when he does, I'll get up and follow him, whatever it requires. Make that decision right where you are. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Trust him, what he did on the cross. Get saved this morning. Then come down the aisle and tell us about that so we can just rejoice and give you a little birthday celebration right here in the sanctuary before you leave the building. You may want to talk about rededicating your life. Christian people, you just come and kneel here and pray. There have been times in this church when this altar filled up from, from the pulpit to the wall on both sides. People just praying, confessing their sins, rededicating their lives. Hadn't happened in years, but it can happen again. It's still here. The altar hasn't moved. You may want to talk about church membership. Be glad to share with you how you can become a member of our church, take part in this ministry, help us. And I promise you, when you leave here, we'll let you take your membership with you. We won't keep it. You can take it where you go next time and, and you'll be glad you did and we'll be glad you did. We'll talk with you about that. If you have a specific prayer request you'd like to share with the pastor, you come as we sing this invitation hymn. This is your time to respond to the voice of God the Holy Spirit. Whatever he's telling you to do, you do it and you'll be glad you did and we'll rejoice with you. Let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. i